ladies and gentlemen, Alahuapa, welcome from all around the globe, whether it's the early morning or late night for you. A very, very warm welcome indeed to Harry's Deepening, where we run from Sundays through to Fridays, covering the revelation of Baha'u'llah, the advent of divine justice. And of course, on Sundays, we have a special guest speaker. Now, I was doing some research on the life of Leonora Armstrong, and it was maybe three in the morning where I woke up and I started saying some prayers and something told me to start doing some research there and then. When I did this, I found dear Christine. She had written an article so many years ago. I decided to send her a message, add her on Facebook, thinking that she would potentially report me to the police for contacting her unsolicited. But of course, she showed nothing but love. And it turns out she is the great grandniece of Leonora Armstrong. So we're so blessed that she's been gracious enough to agree to come on Harry's Deepening and present the life of her grand aunt. Just to give you a little bit of information about dear Christine, who didn't want me to say much, but Christine Leonard Young is from Anchorage, Alaska, and has been a pioneer pretty much most of her life. She's a fifth generation Baha'i, and her parents pioneered during the 10-year crusade arriving in 1956 in Alaska, Kodiak, where she grew up there and also the Bahamas. Then she pioneered to Peru and then South Africa, staying there for 10 years at the age of 22. All three of her children were born there and she finished her degree at the University of California, staying for 19 years and then serving at the Baha'i World Center. It doesn't stop, the list goes on. She then pioneered <laughs> back to Alaska where she resides with her husband, Dennis, who she met at a cluster reflection meeting. You may wanna to go to cluster reflection meetings for those reasons, but anyway, we are very blessed to have her present to us, of course, Friday the 15th was the 100 year anniversary where Leonora Armstrong had left making her journey to Brazil. We're so proud to be able to celebrate our Baha'i women and what a beautiful way in which we can do this. Uh, Donna Leonora, she's known in Brazil and I believe we have a lot of the Brazilian contingent here. She was of course the spiritual mother of South America. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I will indeed pass this over to dear Christine now, who is going to present for us if you have any comments or questions, there will be time at the end of her presentation for us to address those. You are warmly invited to Harry's Deepening and dear Christine, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it's really a great pleasure to be here, to have been invited to join you all this morning from Anchorage. I have to give many thanks to Dave and Nick for actually finding me from so far away. The last time I was with my great aunt, I was a teenager and had very little idea of what her life had been like or what great and inspiring things she had done in service to the faith. And so it's been my great fortune over the years to research her letters, memoirs, and those of friends and family in order to share her truly inspiring life with others. This past Friday, the 15th of January, was the 100th year anniversary, as Dave said, of the day that my great aunt Leonora Sterling Holesapple left New York City by steamship for a lifelong adventure in Brazil. She had no idea what this first great movement was to produce. It was the first of several epic journeys she was to embark upon, the greatest being the journey of her heart, the journey taken for her love of Baha'u'llah, her obedience to Abdul Baha, and later of Shoghi Effendi and the Universal House of Justice. This presentation then is from a previous one titled Tablets of the Divine Plan, Heeding the Call. And I begin with an excerpt from Abdul Baha that had to have been one of Leonora's constant companions. Wherefore, look not on the degree of your capacity. Ask not if you are worthy of the task. Rest ye your hopes on the help and loving kindness, the favors and bestowals of Baha'u'llah. May my soul be offered up for his friends. Urge on the steed of high endeavor over the field of sacrifice and carry away from this wide arena the prize of divine grace. It's a small part, this, of a larger project uh, to present the life of a remarkable woman in Baha'i history. As we are so often encouraged by the House of Justice to learn stories that touch the heart in order to teach the faith, this is also a story. In this story, there are two parts. 
The second part of the story is that of a 22 year old girl who in 1980 wrote to the archives department of the Baha'i World Center asking for papers or any kind of information that they might have about her great aunt and thus beginning her long half a lifetime long journey of the learning of the first story. The first story being that of another young woman, a 23 year old who heeded the call of Abdu'l Baha in 1919, obeyed the summons to travel to distant lands and thus emblazoned her name on the pages of the history of our faith. 97 years ago, more now, the tablets of the divine plan written by Abdul Baha were the call to take the message of Baha'u'llah to all corners of the earth, and it is still the same for us today. As in the hidden words, he writes, seize thy chance, for it will come to thee no more. Abdul Baha said to not look on the degree of your capacity, nor to ask if you are worthy of the task. He said, to rest your hopes on the help and loving kindness, the favors and the stoles of Baha'u'llah. He admonished us to urge on the steed of high endeavor over the field of sacrifice and carry away from this wide arena the prize of divine grace. So my question for today is, in examining this first history, just how can we be inspired by the efforts of this small, shy young woman of 1919. Her name was Leonora Holzapple of Hudson, New York. She was small in stature with dark hair and slightly downward sloping eyes set in a sweet heart-shaped face. She had been raised in part after her mother's unexpected death by her maternal grandmother who had embraced the Baha'i revelation in 1906. Leonora was named after this grandmother, who she says eventually became her true spiritual mother. Having discovered the Baha'i revelation, as it was called back at the turn of the 20th century, at the age of about 76, Grandmother Sterling had been put in touch with Isabella Brittingham, another early American Baha'i, with whom she then corresponded. Through their letters and at least one known visit of theirs in Hudson in 1910, Leonora's grandmother Sterling was deepened in the teachings of Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l Baha as Mrs. Brittingham transcribed and shared tablets with her. Leonora's grandmother then meticulously copied them into her own notebooks as they had not yet been compiled and printed. And often she memorized long passages of these tablets in order to recite them at meetings. This was her reward for a long and difficult life of search for spiritual truth as a young widowed single mother in an era when women were not thought of as heads of household. Grandmother Sterling had raised Leonora's mother, Grace, during the 1870s and 80s on a seamstress and later a girl's school matron's salary and struggled so that Grace might be among one of the earliest classes at Smith College. Grace only stayed two years in college as she realized the sacrifices being there meant for her mother, and she left college to work as a teacher at the same girls' reformatory institution that her mother had been matron at in Hudson, New York. Here, she met and married Leonora's father, who had been appointed treasurer of the reformatory. Leonora's father, Samuel Norris Hosapel, was from a large, well-established family that had come as farmers to Columbia County on the Hudson River from Holland during the 17th century. His uncles and older brothers had all become prominent lawyers, bankers, and businessmen in Columbia County. The young couple were married in 1892 and built a lovely cottage on a high hill overlooking the town of Hudson. And Leonora was their first child, born there on 23rd of June, 1895. Leonora's mother, Grace, was said to have been the most beautiful and most cultured woman of their town of about 10,000 people at that time. She had founded a woman's club, was a member of the Board of Education, and was an artist and a writer. 
So her early death in 1900, at only age 31, was a huge tragedy for the little family. And Leonor says that it had a terrible effect on them all, but especially disoriented their father to the point where they never had again what could be called a home. Both grandmothers tried to be of assistance, but were unable to continue as their father became more difficult to be with. She described her childhood as years of enduring loneliness, suffering, cruelty, and hair-raising accidents, where they had hairbreadth escapes from being seriously injured or killed when their father would take them on trips while intoxicated, first recklessly driving horses and later cars. She remembers as a very small child, often before bed at night, kneeling at her little sister's bedside and in agony of soul, imploring God with all the intensity of her being to let them feel his presence, his nearness, his protection. Her ever constant escape was in reading and study. And from kindergarten to college, she was almost always the first, though the youngest, of the class and graduated from high school with the highest honors and at Cornell University being elected to Phi Beta Kappa in her junior year and graduating at age 19. But none of these honors could replace the complete lack of self-confidence she felt due to the unhappiness and insecurities of her childhood. As soon as Leonora and her little sister Alith were old enough to be sent alone they regularly attended the Episcopal Sunday school and church, though they found none of the warmth or friendliness which they longed for. Even their aunts, uncles, and cousins ignored them at church, and Leonora felt disillusioned and never treated like part of the church family. Leonora was about 11 when her grandmother Sterling embraced the Baha'i revelation and discussed some of the concepts with her and her sister. They read a few of the small books like The Oriental Rose by Mary Hanford Ford, which impressed her, as well as one by Thornton Chase. She and her sister began to memorize some of the hidden words and Baha'i prayers. Her grandmother played Baha'i hymns on their piano, at one time taking a new piece of music from an envelope from Louise Waite entitled Benediction and asking her sister Alith to play it for them immediately on the piano. Grandmother Sterling also devoted much of her time to writing long letters about the faith to all the people she had ever known, and Leonora observed her enthusiasm in giving the message to everyone she knew or met in any way, even calling on the ministers in all the local churches, whether white or colored, in the city of Hudson. Leonora also remembers the first feast she ever attended as a girl was in the very humble home of two elderly Negro washerwomen. So we see a pattern was being set for her life, though she did not know it. In 1912, when Abdul Baha visited America, Grandmother Sterling was overjoyed to be able to attend public meetings with him in New York City, and also had private meetings with him, at one of which he pinned a big white rose on her coat. At this time, Leonora was at Cornell University in Ithaca, and she could not get permission to interrupt her studies that spring for the 220 mile long journey to New York City in order to see Abdul Baha. Her grandmother Sterling was busily trying to arrange for him to visit their town of Hudson, just 80 miles north of the city during the summer, and Leonora felt reassured that she would have a chance to meet him there. Unfortunately, after flurries of letters during April between Grandmother Sterling and Mrs. Brittingham, it was proved to be impossible to fit into Abdul Baha's schedule, and their disappointment was intense. While in high school and university, Leonora tried to follow her grandmother's example of spreading the Baha'i message. She would speak of it to friends or classmates, however brief the opportunity. Actually, one of these friends wrote to her more than 50 years later to say she had joined the faith and wanted to come serve with her in Brazil. So Leonora became more convinced of the truth of the Baha'i teachings as she enrolled in classes at Cornell in comparative religions, including a complete course on the Bible with a famous professor. 
She never told anyone, but she had secretly read the entire Bible straight through when she was just a small child. It was also during these formative teenage years that both Leonora and her sister Elite attended Greenacre Baha'i Retreat in Maine with their grandmother and also as housekeepers at Fellowship House for summer sessions. Here she was brought into contact with many early American Baha'is and had the opportunity to be part of a micro Baha'i community. After graduating from Cornell in 1915, at only age 19, Leonora worked for five years teaching Latin in high schools, and also two of those years doing social work in Boston, where she was able to be part of a larger community of Baha'is. Most particularly, she recalls living near the Obers in Cambridge, and that while she lived there, Mae Maxwell also often visited from Montreal. Leonora pinpoints that the event that touched her heart and set her on a consecrated path for the rest of her life, little knowing that she would spend 60 years serving the cause in Brazil, was her attendance at the unveiling of the tablets of the divine plan. On the evening of 28 April 1919, a hush fell after the last strains of harp music left the hall and an expectant atmosphere prevailed as a speaker moved to the front of the meeting room of the Hotel McAlpin. The estimated 600 delegates and friends gathered in New York City for the 11th Baha'i Convention and Congress had just enjoyed a feast together and a talk by Harlan Ober on the purposes and hopes of the Congress. The night air was alive with the excitement created only by the momentousness of the occasion the revelation of the tablets of the divine plan of Abdu'l-Baha to the Western world. Abdu'l-Baha had made many requests of the American Baha'i community, entrusting, among others, this message to them through one of the friends traveling from Palestine to the United States. He said, let me see what the friends of God in these states will do. Will they arise with a superhuman energy and spread the lights of the sun of reality in all those great cities, towns, villages, and hamlets, I have pointed out to them the highway of service. Will they walk in it? The convention talks made during those special days were filled with details of these meetings with Abdu'l-Bahá over a period of several months, including many direct quotations and in which Abdu'l-Bahá urged and encouraged the friends on to greater heights of service. One wonders how the hearts could not be touched after these entreaties from Abdu'l-Bahá himself. Soon after attending the 1919 convention in New York City, Leonora wrote a letter to Abdu'l-Bahá asking for his guidance in how she might best serve the faith but the answer was many months in arriving. Communications with post-war time Palestine were difficult, inconsistent, and unreliable. The translation was made by Shoghi Effendi in July, 1919, but the tablet didn't reach her until several months later in the spring of 1920. Even though World War I was officially ended, the long-term effects of disrupted travel and communications as well as the continued instability of Palestine and the Middle East hampered travel and delayed most mail service. The tablet revealed to her by Abdu'l-Bahá at Baji took more than six months to reach her in the United States. In March of 1920, Leonora was staying as a general helper in the household of Safa and Sarah Kinney during her vacation from teaching school and planning to attend that year's convention planned in New York City when her long awaited reply arrived in America from Palestine. In it, Abdu'l-Bahá counseled her, beginning to the maid servant of God, Leonora Holsapel, Cambridge, Massachusetts, USA. Upon her be Baha'u'llah, he is God. O thou who art believing in God, thy letter was received. Thou hadst expressed thy great wish to be of service to the divine threshold and to heal the infirm 
with the divine panacea, the infirm who is afflicted with passion and self. Spiritual malady is more severe than physical illness, for it may be that the latter may be converted by the least remedy into health and vigor, while the former will not be cured by a thousand well-known remedies. He ended with, my hope is that thou mayest become a spiritual physician. So on a practical note, Leonora had also been led to correspond with Martha Root in order to get advice on what part of the world needed a resident Baha'i. I don't think they called it pioneering just yet. Leonora had saved enough money for a one-way ticket on a steamship to South America. She figured that by the time the ship sailed on January 15th, she would have enough to pay the passage to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and to live there for two or three weeks. Martha had originally recommended Argentina, having visited Theosophists there on one of her earlier travels for the faith, but later changed her recommendation to Brazil after having received a letter from a Theosophist friend she had made in Santos. She felt that teaching work would go well through him and his contacts there. This change in plans only came up near the end of 1920, and Leonora had already spent some time learning Spanish. Now, all of a sudden, she was planning a move to a country whose language and culture she did not know at all. Meanwhile, over the months, Leonora had wavered in her resolve. Originally, her soul had been moved with great conviction to break with convention, to go as an unmarried woman into an unknown country without a job and just her meager savings, not having one friend, nor even knowing the language. Most of her family did not understand her heartfelt desires and tried to dissuade her from leaving home. Her father had all but disowned her, but she happened to have some very supportive friends who continued to encourage her. And right at the point where she was wavering in her determination to take the plunge, she happened to have to make a business trip up to Northern New York State. And she was able to slip quickly over the border to Montreal, where she made a visit to her dear friend, May Maxwell. May was about the same age as Leonora's mother would have been if she had been alive. And Leonora looked up to her greatly and cherished her friendship and guidance. Upon Leonora's visit, May was unwell and in bed, but invited her into her room. And after hearing that Leonora was losing her resolve to follow her heart, May sat up in bed and as Leonora described it, her luminous eyes turned full upon me with fire in them, it seemed to me, and in ringing tones that still re-echo in my heart, she exclaimed, go, what are you waiting for? Go. And that is when she went straight back home to New York and bought the first boat ticket she could reserve for Rio. No more listening to family members whittle away at her confidence. She trusted in the promises of Baha'u'llah. She forgot all self and plunged into the unknown against all the admonitions of her well-meaning family. After her visit with May, Leonora was galvanized into action and purchased a ticket on the very next ship, leaving New York for Brazil. It was indeed her great fortune right at that time in early January, 1921, that Leonora also had the opportunity for a visit with Martha Root in Boston. She said they spent a precious hour together, seated in a hotel lobby, talking and praying from the bottom of their hearts. Later on, but before Leonora's journey, Martha sent her an enormous trunk, large enough to hold all her books and containing many things that she knew would be useful to her, such as linen, cutlery, even a small rug and other gifts that Leonora still treasured always including among them a hair from the head of Baha'u'llah. Thus, on 15 January 1921, Leonora sailed from New York City Harbor on the SS Vasari, bound for Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. As her grandmother described it in a letter to Ella Robards, Leonora sailed away on the 15th and kept up bravely to the last, smiling and waving goodbyes to her father, and sister after they had left the ship. 
The voyage of 17 days allowed her to meet many of her fellow second-class passengers, as well as the crew, and several showed real interest, reading her literature and spending many hours discussing with her the various aspects of the faith. The two most outstanding contacts of the voyage were a young Brazilian woman, Aida de Inas, who had been in New York studying, and Elsie Pappas, a young, newly married Swiss woman. As Leonora expressed it, both were so deeply impressed by the power which they felt in the words of Baha'u'llah and were so eager to tell others of it, especially Mrs. Pappas, who had almost at the first moment recognized the truth, that I mentioned them in my letter to Abdul Baha and in his tablet in reply, dated June 1, 1921, the first tablet addressed to anyone in Brazil. He asked me to convey to them the glad tidings of the divine blessings. As a small side note, Shoghi Effendi commented on the role of women in the Baha'i faith in the advent of divine justice by quoting Abdul Baha. He said that, quote, among the miracles Abdul Baha himself has testified, which distinguish the sacred dispensation is this, that women have evinced a greater boldness than men when enlisted in the ranks of the faith. Abdul Baha used the word miracles. So women like May Bowles, Maxwell, Martha Root, and Leonora Holzapple had but to draw on the divine power of Baha'u'llah, obeying the call to arise, putting one foot in front of the other and persevering once they got going. So it might seem astounding, but Leonora had been called a child prodigy, had never admitted to anyone at the time that she had actually read the Bible straight through while still just a child, was always the youngest in her school classes, but usually at the top scholastically, that she had attained the status of Phi Beta Kappa in just her junior, her third year of university, and graduated from Cornell at age 19, just before her 20th birthday. She had studied Greek, and had been guided to specialize in Latin and the sciences, but had always hidden away in her books due to the unhappiness of her childhood. And now she was able to mine all these gems of capacity as she traveled throughout Brazil and later to other countries of South America and the Caribbean. Her talents were to be put to extraordinary use in service to establishing on a new continent the dispensation of Baha'u'llah. So luckily, while still en route to Brazil, Leonora found herself in a difficult predicament and her newfound friends on board the ship saw that she had no idea of the social mores and restrictions of Brazil at that time. Brazilians being more conventional than the rising openness in America regarding women's dress, smoking, voting, and other freedoms were not used to the idea of a young woman traveling alone. And these new friends of hers took it upon themselves to be sure to assist and accompany her from the time they all left the ship. They still had great difficulty getting to a place, uh, getting a place in a suitable hotel because one after another of them refused to allow her to stay until finally only at one called Hotel dos Estrangeros granted them a room, I mean, strangers hotel. And as Leonora explained, what I could have done without my Brazilian friend, Aida, I do not know, but it is unnecessary to know for she was provided. And in the same way, in whatever strange country or city I have since visited to serve the faith, at least one key person has been provided to open all the doors. This was first Leonora's first travel abroad, and it had never occurred to her to seek out the American consulate for advice or information. She knew no one but her new friend, Aida, who insisted on staying with her those first few weeks in Rio in order that she not be labeled as a loose woman. 
She had studied a little Portuguese with Aida and Elsie on board ship for about 17 days. And now she was plunged into this new alien world. The 12 anxious days stay in Rio was agony as her small funds dwindled and she awaited reply to her cable sent immediately upon their arrival to Martha's Theosophus contact in Santos. But day passed by day as no word came with instructions for her as to how to proceed. But she had been guided so far and trusting that the way would open if she made the effort. Finally, word came by reply cable that she should take the small boat from Rio to Santos on the Costeira line. This little boat rocked interminably and her three cabin mates were all sick. So thankfully it was a short trip. She describes her arrival like a sad movie, alone on deck, waiting and watching through the torrential rain as all the other passengers disembarked and were greeted by loving friends and family. The wait seemed interminable, but eventually the young Theosophist emerged at the end of the dock, clutching a huge umbrella. In reflecting on her arrival in Santos in 1921, Leonora later wrote that she longed to shout out the message from the housetops, that it was difficult not to feel discouraged not to ask myself sometimes what, after all, I could ever hope to do alone on this vast continent without resources, with no gift of eloquence. She said that she tearfully supplicated, oh God, I am a broken winged bird. Have pity on my weakness. Strengthen me by thy power. There were no airplanes, no telephones, no internet, no email or Facebook. She eagerly awaited the arrival of each ship from North America bearing letters from friends and family. They came only once every six weeks. One such letter arrived during her first year there addressed on the outside simply to Leonora Sterling Holsapple, Brazil. Inside it said, to the maidservant of God, Leonora Sterling Holsapple, Unto her be the glory of God, the most glorious. It then went on to say, He is the most glorious. Thy letter was received. Do thou thank God that thou hast enlightened thy sight and art giving light to the sight of others too, that thou hast drunk from the overflowing goblet of the love of God and art also giving to others to drink. About her first months in 1921 in Santos, Brazil, Leonor remembered, my bare little room lacking in comfort of any kind and looking out on the kitchen and also the unspeakably poor food were different from anything I had ever known. But this did not seem to me to be really important, nor did the fact that instead of teaching Latin, in a select private school as Walnut Hill of Natick, I was to be a bookkeeper in a Ford agency and repair shop and to have to give English lessons early every morning and for two or three hours at night, besides the eight or nine hours at the agency, just to meet the expense of room and board, not having enough left even to pay car fare to and from my work. Abdul Baha had expressed a hope for me that I might become a spiritual physician to heal the infirm with the divine panacea. And in his tablet to Martha Root, he had said that if some souls with perfect severance, devotion, firmness, and steadfastness in the covenant journeyed to South America, they would become like unto Peter and Paul confirmed. Perfect severance, that was the key to success as Martha had so impressed upon me when she came to Boston to talk with me shortly before my departure. Severance from dearest friends, comforts, profession, from everything in order to gain the blessings of being poor in all save God. So as Leonora described it on one particularly gloomy, cloudy day while walking along a squalid street, 
she had the sudden realization that she had the glorious promises of Baha'u'llah on which to fix her gaze, as well as in his personal tablet to her, that there would arise from these regions such a melody as to rejoice and exhilarate the supreme concourse. Despite all her discomfort, long hours, hard work, and futile feelings that she was accomplishing so little, she alone succeeded in laying a foundation of contacts and knowledge of the language and society of her newly adopted country. In April 1921, after struggling to earn her livelihood with a meager office job and teaching English very early each morning and fighting also a severe case of typhoid for several months, she began to make inroads into teaching through meeting with theosophists and was encouraged to present a talk at the National Esperanto Conference in Rio. She applied to present her talk, thinking that she would not get invited, but was indeed accepted. So after being in Brazil for only three months and still knowing very little Portuguese and virtually nothing of Esperanto, she traveled to Rio on her own and gave a talk in Esperanto on the Baha'i Faith. Well, not only was she timid about giving talks in public, but Leonora had developed a style of speaking where she quoted pieces from Abdul Baha's Paris talks. Thus her listeners could not help but be affected by his words of love, unity, and hope for the future. When her theosophist friend encouraged her to give a talk for the National Esperanto Conference that year in Rio, she not only had to prepare her talk, but she had to translate it into Esperanto, the language of which she barely knew. By New Year's Day, 1922, just 11 months after her arrival in the country, she gathered more fruits of her perseverance. Despite her shy, timid personality, she had learned to rely upon the words of Abdu'l-Baha and Baha'u'llah in order to open the doors to teaching. And Leonora had another opportunity to give a talk about the faith, this time at Festa Fraternidade, held in Rio, well, sorry, held in Sao Paulo, and also a talk at a local spiritualist center. This is an example of Esperanto. Then early in 1922, Leonora's father sent her money for a passage home to New York and encouraged her to come by way of the Amazon, thinking that this would be her one chance in a lifetime to see such an important area of South America. But by carefully economizing, Leonora was able to stretch the money to include visits to of several days, weeks, or even months in all of the principal cities on her way. Leonora had been especially drawn to the city of Bahia because of the exhortations of Abdu'l Baha, and she had longed to visit. So on her arrival, she went first to the American consul to check for mail and was asked personally by the consul if she would like to teach his children for three months in exchange for room and board. She knew her prayers had been answered in a way to provide for a meaningful stay in Bahia, and the sea air, good food, and the consul's comfortable home helped her regain her health and strength. She gave lessons only during the mornings and had the remainder of the day for Baha'i work. With the help of an organization, Star of the East, which was affiliated with the Theosophical Society, she was able to hold weekly meetings at their headquarters print and distribute handbills and get announcements in the newspapers. As an added attraction, she offered to give lessons in Esperanto, which she managed to teach by keeping always a lesson or two ahead of the pupils. And in her preparation each week for the Baha'i talks, she was assisted by a good Portuguese teacher. The first person to respond to her teaching in Bahia was embraced by embracing the faith was Claudinor Luz a young man who was owner of a small bookshop, which she had first visited while in search of a Portuguese Bible. From Bahia, Leonora continued on up the coast of Brazil by ship, stopping at the major ports of Recife and Fortaleza on the way to Belém at the mouth of the Amazon River. It was on this first trip back to the United States that Leonora met Belma de Barros, 
who became the first Brazilian of Recife to declare their belief in Baha'u'llah. Here, newspaper articles were published almost every day and public meetings attracted over 100 people. In Belém, Leonora gave public lectures and garnished astonishing newspaper publicity. As she headed up the Amazon River, her contact in Belém, Senor Castillo, arranged to publish the Paris Talks manuscript in Portuguese and distributed pamphlets she had left with him. Traveling up river for eight days in a gaiola, gaiola or a little cage style boat, she made stops at Santarém, Ovidos, Paranchins, and Icochiara, where she made contacts where possible. Leonora stayed one week in Manaus as guest of the president of the Theosophical Society, Senor Gastal de Castro, and his wife, Dona Ernestina, a wonderfully kind couple who showed true Brazilian hospitality and helped her give several public meetings. One was to an audience of about 200 people. Another was attended by over 300 people. She delivered a paper to the Theosophist group and several newspaper articles were published. She had private interviews as well, including one with the son of the governor for the state of Amazonas. On the return voyage down the Amazon to Belém, Leonora talked with a newspaper man from the state of Pará, which resulted in a few articles. She delivered a talk on deck of the ship for 60 passengers. She gave booklets to a woman heading for the interior of Argentina, Bolivia, Peru, and other South American countries who was eager to share Leonora's teachings. From Belém, Leonora returned to New York and her previous position working for a year again at the New York State Training School for Girls in Hudson, and soon was appointed chief parole agent. Her happiness at being with her family and Baha'i friends again was indescribable. And during this visit, she spent as much time with them as she could. The work she was doing with what was called the delinquent girl problem was interesting to her and something she really enjoyed as she supervised and planned the work of four or five other assistant agents, coped with vast correspondence and counseled girls previous to their parole. Also, she had some traveling to do, received an excellent salary and had her own private apartment in the institution where everything was done for her, right down to her mending. Her career was going well here and more importantly, she was earning better income and able to add to her depleted financial savings again. She knew she had made just the barest beginning in the immense country of Brazil and that there were new Baha'is needing to be nurtured. She received letters from Claude Norluz in Bahia of, inter of increased interest in the faith and she began feeling strongly drawn to return. So on 18 March, 1923, she wrote to Shogi Effendi about staying in America in order to earn a better living and asking advice on whether to go back to Brazil or to stay on at her job in New York. He urged her to return to Brazil. Leonora's younger sister, Elite Holzapfel, had also graduated from Cornell a few years behind Leonora and become a social worker, following in the paths of their grandmother, mother, and her sister. She decided to take a leave of absence of about five months and accompany Leonora back to Brazil. Having her beloved sister with her for this time, Leonora says, helped her make the parting from America easier. Another Baha'i woman whom Leonora had met in Buffalo, Miss Maud Mickle, also chose to join them to serve in Brazil. So in December, 1923, Leonora sailed on her second trip to Brazil with her sister Elise and friend Maud Mickle. They made various contacts on the English ship and one Sunday morning, even being asked by the captain to take charge of the religious service for all the officers and passengers with his permission to use freely their Baha'i teachings and prayers. During the month of December, they traveled up the Amazon River to Manaus again for Leonora's second time and spent several weeks teaching there during the month with the untiring, hospitable help again of Senor Gaston and his wife. 
Arriving back in Belém, they gave two public meetings. They then continued down the coast of Brazil, stopping for three days in Fortaleza, where they held three public meetings and received good newspaper coverage. In Recife, they gave two public lectures, generated newspaper publicity, and were met by Leonor's previous contact, Belma de Barros. In Maceo, they spent just 24 hours, but held a public meeting and several individual firesides. As they continued to sail down the coast to Rio, Leonora gave a 40 minutes talk to those on board, as well as individual firesides. While in Rio, Leonora says that the three of them indulged in sightseeing, as well as did some teaching work. Then from Rio, they traveled on to Sao Paulo and to Santos, where Alita particularly wanted to meet the mother and daughter who had nursed Leonora at their home in their only bedroom for the months that she battled typhoid, most likely having saved her life. In April 1924, the three arrived in Bahia and Alita then returned to the United States aboard the SS Voltaire. It was exceedingly hard for Leonora to part with her sister whom she loved so deeply. The value of her sister's moral support all through the years could not be overestimated. Material assistance too, as Elith later sent her clothing, Baha'i books and money in emergencies. Eventually, Leonora simply could not calculate the encouragement and support she received from her only sister. So the three arrived back in Bia during April 1924 with sadly depleted funds owing to all the stopovers and prolonged stays. Once Elith had sailed for New York, Leonora and Maud needed urgently to rent a cheap house immediately as they could not afford a hotel for long before they would completely run out of money. So they bought one chair for each of them and one table, which they had found in a secondhand furniture store. The Bazaar des Pobres, or Poor People's Bazaar, as well as two straw mattresses. These with their trunks were taken on a donkey cart up the steep hill to the little house they had found. Leonora wrote that, quote, the house had a cement floor, but if I remember rightly, no ceiling, nor, as we found to our disappointment, any running water, nor a stove of any kind. Two young Negro women, our neighbors, kindly loaned us a small charcoal burner on which we cooked until I had earned enough money from lessons to be able to buy one. An amusing incident comes to my mind. Sometimes during the first nights we were frightened at hearing our gate open, so thought we should put a bell on it. I purchased one therefore for four mires, but Maud on making some calculations as she was the housekeeper and my part was the English teaching and translating became alarmed and announced that we should be starving by the end of the month without that money I had spent on the gate. Thus, I was obliged to appeal to the shopkeeper to take back his bell. Researching the value of the four mini race in 1924, it was approximately 10 cents. But in our current value, it's about $5 and a half or four pounds, something around there. So the foundational teaching work of Bahia now began in earnest and was described by Leonora in part as centering around the assistance of their first devoted Brazilian Baha'i, Claudinor Luz. She explained how he used to climb up the hill at night to our meetings, bringing others after a short time we'd been able to buy more chairs. But it was really far out of town and our steep hill was so muddy and slippery in the rainy season as to be a little dangerous. Thus, as soon as our financial situation permitted, we moved into the city renting the entire second floor of Rue Chile 21, the principal street in the center of the upper city, hence the best possible location for Baha'i meetings. Claudinor at once had a large placard made bearing the words Centro Baha'i in large letters, which extended across the entire front of the second story of the building. Two medical students who were attracted to this placard or by the newspaper notices were instrumental in making one of their most important contacts, that with a group of workers in Calzada, one of the poorer sections on the outskirts of the city. In the very humble home of one of these, Dona 
Tanya Miranda. Meetings were held on Sunday afternoons during several years. Among these simple, humble, but sincere devoted people, about 22 of them signed a letter to the guardian expressing their entire sympathy with the faith, their loyalty to him, and asking his prayers for their spiritual growth. Claude Norluz and another young man, Iram Faria, worked tirelessly for the cause, also working together with Leonora on translations until late every night during those years. Much progress was made in Bahia between 1924 and the end of 1925 when Maud returned to the US. Between them, they created a nice environment at a new and larger home that they were eventually led to rent. One that was in a nice section of town with Maud doing the housekeeping, shopping and cooking and Leonora doing the teaching and translating. They rented out a few of the rooms to some English boys and had a small school for English and American children. One of these pupils was Margot Gleig, who later became Margot Worley, who was destined to render outstanding service to the faith in South America. Leonora was able during this time with the support of Maud to also give many private English lessons constantly, sometimes up to 10 hours a day, which afforded countless opportunities for speaking about the faith with individuals and distributing literature. At the request of the Guardian, they had a leaflet written by Dr. Esselon entitled, What is the Baha'i Movement? Translated into both Portuguese and Spranted and Spanish and printed in Bahia, 2000 copies each. These they distributed as well as shared by mailing to many parts of Latin America and Spain. Another effort was one that the Guardian warmly praised, that of the publication with collaboration of Ibram Faria of a monthly periodical, A Nova Era, which was sent to editors of newspapers and various organizations in the state of Bahia and elsewhere. At first, Leonora did translation work with the help of experts in Portuguese, gradually becoming better and better at it herself and also learning all about publishing. A unique opportunity opened up to Leonora in early 1927 through her friend, Senor Gastão of Manaus, when his family in Fortaleza invited her to come take charge of an English institute there for a few months. She thought this would be a good way to make many contacts for the faith. And indeed the friendliness she remembered from her visit there in 1924 proved evident as Senor Gastão's family and their friends became interested in the teachings. But then in a quite unexpected way, the Baha'i cause was brought to the attention of the public in an unusual way. An epidemic of cholera broke out and Leonora decided to offer her services to the public health department in distributing medicines among the many very poor fishermen's families living along the beaches. The newspapers called her the Enfermera dos Pobres or the nurse of the poor although she had never ever been trained in or practiced nursing. But this notoriety opened the door for other opportunities to share the faith, including the invitation to speak to all the prisoners in the state penitentiary in their chapel on Easter morning. Leonora's focus was continually upon those less fortunate in life, the nameless and traceless poor that Abdu'l-Baha had mentioned in the tablets of the divine plan are the leaders of mankind. In 1927, Leonora's father sent her money again for a passage to New York from Brazil. This time he knew it would be just a visit and gave her money enough to visit some other countries on the way. She visited family and friends in New York and at Greenacre in Maine. But this was another of her courageous and extensive trips involving teaching stops in nine countries and our time is pretty much used up this morning. In brief, on this voyage, she visited Haiti, Trinidad, Suriname, or Dutch Guyana, Guyana, British, which was British Guyana, Curaçao, Panama, Venezuela, and Barbados. Later on in life, Leonora would continually berate her teaching efforts. But when surveying her early teaching work from 2021, it seems most likely in her comparison to the intense teaching 
she had undertaken during those early years of introducing the faith to so many countries, towns, and villages on the South American continent and the Caribbean, that she felt ineffective in her later efforts. What she wasn't taking into consideration were the dozens of new pioneers who settled on the continent from about 1937 onward, following in her footsteps. The many travel teachers she hosted and introduced to her friends as fresh inspiration in her teaching work or the immense labor she performed for the future of the Brazilian people and other Portuguese speaking communities in her persistent, continual translating of the Baha'i writings into that language until her death. Despite her extreme modesty and all her accomplishments, her timidity in facing the public, what we can take from her example is Leonor's utter obedience to Abdu'l Baha and Shoghi Effendi her perseverance and dedication to serving the Brazilian people, both socially as well as in the legacy of her translations of the Baha'i writings from the very beginning, and her devotion to remain in her pioneering post for 60 years despite later illness in her old age. So in answer to my originally posed question about how we can be inspired, we can see how the tablets of the divine plan were the impetus as well as the sustaining spirit to all those who left their homes to spread the Baha'i revelation during the formative age. It was actually Huber Dunbar who pointed out that Leonora left home during the heroic age and continued to serve in her pioneering post into the formative age. She is now buried on the eastern shore of Brazil in the city of Bahia whose name was christened through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and whose efficacy Abu Baha prophesized would be most potent. Above is, is sorry. Above is the facsimile of a postscript added to a letter of 25 May, 1925 by Shoghi Effendi in his hand, which reads, Dear spiritual sister, I always eagerly await your news and every information you can give me as to the progress of your valuable work. Never feel disheartened. Remain steadfast and confident. The hour of triumph will strike and the record of your heroic efforts and services will ever adorn the annals of this mighty cause. I assure you of my continued prayers, Shogi. The constant encouragement from Shoghi Effendi over the years through his stream of letters kept Leonora going, as well as the two tablets she received from Abdu'l Baha. In another early letter, this one from 1928, Shoghi Effendi had written prophetically, my dear and precious coworker, your services are engraved upon my heart and your name will live to adorn the annals of our cause. Persevere and do not feel discouraged, for the beloved is guiding you and sustaining you from on high. Your well-wisher, Shoghi. Wonderful. Thank you so very much for inspiring us. I'm, I can see people clapping and obviously people very, very inspired and excited by your incredible presentation. And I know your dear sister Cindy is also there. I don't know if she has anything in particular she would like to add. Um, truly remarkable. And one of the things about the life of dear Leonora is the fact that she managed to do what she did, having much less information than we have available to us right now. The uh, amount of writings that were translated at the time were much, much less than the way in which you could travel and find things out. So this really stands as a true inspiration to each and every one of us. And who would have thought back then, again, from what I understand, your, the first relative in your family was it was in 1906 that she embraced the faith, if I'm not mistaken. And to, to have this coming down all the way now, where here we are in 2021, where we're discussing the life of this lady who just got up by herself and pioneered and became the spiritual mother of an entire continent. 
These are the things that I guess are very inspiring to us. And of course, in our own actions, wherever city or wherever place we lie, maybe in 2,121, they'll be discussing the actions that we've taken, hopefully for the good. And this is there, it's available for us. This second installment of the Dawnbreakers, as it were, is being written and through uh, people like dear Leonora and uh, potentially us here, we have this opportunity, this privilege to do so. It is truly inspiring, it really is. And this is a piece of history that thankfully we have been gifted by dear Christine, of course, whose knowledge is immense on the subject of Leonora Armstrong. She has been piecing together a book, which hopefully in the next year or so will be coming through. We don't know exactly what the time frame is, but there's a lot more to take from this, things to learn. I mean, she was someone who didn't like giving speeches from what I understood, and she had learned so much of Abdul Baha's talks. How incredible is that? Each of us could do that and would go and speak in front of countless amounts of people. The stories of her are mind-blowing. I would like to know what kind of background Leonora came from. Was she German, Swiss, British? And um, another question is, I see her maiden name as something, and then I see Armstrong. Was she married? When she was a girl, her name was Leonora Sterling Holsapp. Holsapel, her father's name came from Holland. It's a Dutch name. Sterling was the name given to her because it was her grandmother's surname, Scottish, Sterling. And uh, she used that. Sometimes she would use Leonora Sterling Armstrong, her married name. For so many years, she was Leonora Holsapel because she didn't marry until she was about 45 years old. Yeah, my uncle Harold was actually Irish and he was an engineer and she met him in uh, Fortaleza, Brazil. He had emigrated from Ireland during, you know, bef I think before, but it was well before the first, second world war, but so it must've been, it was around the first world war that he came out to Brazil from the UK. They never had any children of their own because she was 45 when they were married. And it was his second marriage. He had two daughters, one of whom passed away. He had two girls and a boy that were not Baha'is and never lived with them. They were well grown up. And what uh, Harold and Leonora did was they adopted just, I mean, so many children in many different ways. like adopted them to live with them, adopted them just to send them to school, over a dozen children. Thanks very much for that question. Next question goes to Joanna Sabet in North Carolina. Well, first of all, I want to say hi to Christine. Um, hi, Joanne. She knows that I lived with uh, Leonora in 1974, so it's two years after the picture that was taken in the Panama Temple, mm. and you described her very well. She was very humble. Her life was totally dedicated to the Baha'i faith. I mean, every breathing moment, she just worked for the faith. She would take uh, buses, and she was so old, to travel to different places, to meet uh, auxiliary board members, to constantly be in contact. Um, the year I lived with her, of course, there were no computers, there were no, everything was by post. And um, she taught me how to make oatmeal cookies. We would go up on her roof of her house and say prayers. And at that time, she was living in a place called Juiz de Fora, which is judged from the outside. And I don't want to take up any more time, but it was really precious. I actually got married during the time that I was living with her. And she couldn't attend the wedding, but she sent me, which was so typical, a silver rose that I still have because she loved roses, always had roses all over her house. So those are just a few things I could share. Another story that I heard from Gabrielle Marx is this story that dear Leonora, she was very sick at one point and she went to a, a hospital as such and it was a Catholic hospital and they said to her, they said, we just want to check that you are indeed a Catholic and Leonora responded saying that she is indeed a believer in Christ and she uh, accepts his holiness Christ and certainly the Bible is very special to her but she's also a Baha'i and while she was very sick that was when she was in Spain. She was in Madrid studying Spanish in 1930. 
and she contracted uh, scarlet fever. I'm, I get all the diseases mixed up. I have to double check that. Don't quote me yet. But um, definitely when the nun found out she was not a Catholic um, and she was doing x-rays and she smashed her like hard into the metal of the x-rays uh, machine and, and just knocked her about and really treated her rudely. That's true. Which just shows her character at every turn again, facing these trials and tribulations and carrying on where she could have potentially said something different. We have a, another comment or a question to be made from dear Nashville. Nashville, please. Allah hafa, dear Christine. I do remember Donna Leonora's uh, husband, herself, her beautiful house in Juiz de Fora. I remember going to a conference in Recife, in Bahia with her. Uh, we were a lot together. We were like, you know, one family with Donna Leonora. But I just wanted to say that whenever we had hands of the cause in our house, in Bello Horizonte, Donna Leonora would come from Juiz de Fora, even though she was not the healthiest or, she was healthy, but she was not very young then. And um, I had the honor of saying the memorial prayer for her husband in Juiz de Fora. So many memories from her. She was the most intelligent lady. She dedicated all her life to uh, translating the writings, uh, Baha'i writings, the very first prayer books, um, Seven Valleys, all these books from English to uh, Portuguese. I just wanted to thank you, Christine, for honoring her life, for bringing her into everybody's minds, because just the very short version in Ruhi 7 book, uh, to me, was not enough to talk about Leonora. Allah hapa. Thank you very much for your comments. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm aware we've got a few comments, a few people waiting. If I could ask dear Alex Boyson from Norway next to make his comment or question. Thank you, dear Alex. Maybe you, you can say uh, something about how you <clears throat> see your relationship to Abdul Baha in light of Leonora's relationship to the beloved master. I, I think I would need like another couple of years to write on that question, <laughs> how it actually affected my life, because this book has gone with me everywhere. And I've moved from continent to continent and gone through so many different re rebirths in my life that uh, it's been, it's been uh, with me for, for all this time. And uh, it has defined me. In many, in many different stages. Uh, as far as my, my relationship to Abdul Baha, I, I really think that the life that my parents lived as pioneers uh, created my, my, my attitude towards service to the faith. The fact that they lived it, they, they were always thinking in terms, everything was for the faith. Every major decision that they ever made was for the faith. And of course, this is like multitudinous, like times a hundred with my Aunt Leonora. As I did the research on her life, I discovered that she did nothing except for the faith. I mean, she ate just so that she could translate type of, it was, it was so basic. She did not eat fancy things. She just ate enough to stay alive. In other words, everything she did was, um, to, in order that she had the strength to stand and go over translations. She, I, I, I have a vision of her the last time I was staying with her when I was 19, where she was building this little house and uh, outside Jerusalem Sephora, and it was still at the block stage, but she was leaning on the blocks, watching the workmen overseeing the workmen doing the work and on her on and she was holding propped up uh, a, a, a big sheaf of papers that were a manuscript of a translation and she was making corrections on the proof as she watched the builders doing the house she was doing it simultaneously so it was just like the epitome of 
always focus on that, always. I'm actually one of the uh, many Leonoras from Brazil who were named after uh, Leonora Armstrong. And I was actually um, five years old when she passed away. Uh, I was born in Salvador, which is the city where she she's buried and she lived many years of her life, which is the city of Bahia that uh, the, the, the master uh, mentioned. My parents were pioneers from Iran and in Brazil and they arrived in 1968. So there, there are many pictures that I see from them in various meetings and you know, uh, conferences with uh, Dona Leonora. And um, so I think there was a story that my mom mentioned that uh, either when she was pregnant or after I was born, she, 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 she was living in the same city as uh, uh, Leonora Armstrong and she told Leonora, um, uh, my, my daughter is, is named Leonora after you and she she could she just couldn't believe it she was so as you know we all know who she was shy she was so humble she just first thing she asked my mom was what would my first name be because she thought that you know as a child of you know persian uh, pioneers they would name me uh, a persian name and she said no her first name is leonora and she has no other name <laughs> and so that was as though she told me many many years ago and I have a memory of her that which I guess were the last days of her life she was in bed at a, at a house of one of the Baha'i friends that she lived uh, I think her last days with with them um, I remember being called to a, to a room I was playing with the uh, the uh, the host's daughter she's about the same age as I um, and she, I was called into this room. I don't remember what was said, but I remember seeing this, this, this lady very frail in bed. And um, I guess my mom was there or someone and that, that was it. Like I, I, the memory is right here. I can see her right now, but I just, I can't remember what was said. Um, she, my, my father is buried at the same cemetery as Mrs. Armstrong which is called uh, Cemitério dos Estrangeiros, which is a, a cemetery only for foreigners. Thank you very much, dear Leonora. Conscious of the time, um, we'll get some more of these comments or questions. Oh, we'll go to the Democratic Republic of Congo for a, a quick comment or question by uh, dear Empire, please. Thank you so much. I have to thank all the, all the organizers to, to bring us you know, such stories of such sounds. Um, it's like great, great sounds. That without them, we, we will not be, we will not be Baha'i. Some of us will not be Baha'i today, but because of what they decide to sacrifice all their life in the service, that's why today we know that the revelation of Baha'u'llah is now with us in the world. Wonderful. Um, keeping things moving. Again, one of the one of the people who really brought this together and was very instrumental in this, dear Nick Wilding from the United Kingdom. Dear Nick, please. Who went, I understand spent a lot of time in Brazil as well. So please. Despite having lived in Brazil, grown up in Brazil, and even met Dona Leonora as a young child, uh, I, I have to confess that prior to all this, I didn't really know much about her life, other than the fact that she had come to Brazil. <laughs> Uh, in 1921 or thereabouts, and uh, she'd been the first Baha'i in South America. So I really wanted to just express my heartfelt thanks. Thank you. Nick, you speak on behalf of all of us when you share those thoughts, uh, believe me. Again, so inspiring is Leonor Armstrong. Again, that a hundred years on, here we are from all parts of the globe. Would she have imagined that for a second? Maybe Leonora would have done actually. She, she was somewhat the very big, she had imagination. And I think one of the things that's informally, take this with a pinch of salt, that uh, Ruhi Khanun was saying to a, a friend of mine that one of the things the Baha'is sometimes lack is imagination. We sometimes don't realize how great the Concourse and High, those people in the next world, the, the powers that are around us, are there to really help and encourage us and, and do these things. And no doubt many of the feats that Leonora achieved wasn't just because she was incredible, obviously she was, but there was a power that was with her, I'd imagine. And, and Christine, you obviously speak a lot to this. There was. There were several instances where you could find that in uh, what I, I researched. It became very evident. However, the first point about would she ever have dreamed that all these people from all around the world would be 
talking about her life and lauding her accomplishments. She would have crawled under a bed first. She would have hated all the attention. She really didn't like that at all. And as far as imagining it being possible, she never would have imagined it. Um, I'm positive that her ability to do all the things she did were through the powers of Baha'u'llah and her prayer and her trust. And um, she most often would not do things for herself. In other words, the photograph showing our family with Don Lenora in Panama, it took a year of planning to get her there because often there would be a large event and she would be invited and all of the counselors would be like, okay, it's the here, it's there, we're all gonna be there. And she would say, yes, I'm gonna be there. And then everything that was in her life that she was trying to take care of would just be so, so time consuming that she would put off the planning and then she'd get to like the last time that she had left to, to book a flight or something like that. And she'd go and she'd try to book it and it would be really, really difficult. But also she would say, oh, I really don't need to do that. This is, she felt it was an extravagance. She didn't want to spend the money on the air flight. She didn't really like to fly. She, she often in her letters, she would say, well, can't we just take a, can't we just go by boat? You know, like, why can't we just go by boat? And so she really preferred that way of travel. And she didn't, so she didn't want to spend money. She didn't want to take time away from her work. And this is what really, 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 really was the reason why she skipped a lot of events was because she just knew she had piles and piles of correspondence and translation to do. And that if she left for a week or two or whatever, when she got back, it would just be like, she'd be lost. She'd be inundated with it. And so she would often not go to things. So when it came time for the dedication of the Baha'i Temple in Panama, the hands of the cause wrote to my mother, actually cornered my mother at the conference in Jamaica and said, the hands of the cause want Leonora at the dedication of the temple in Panama. It is your job to get her there. You and your husband, Bob, must get her there. And so my mother spent that year trying to work out what they could do. And they, my, between my mom and dad, they decided that the best way was to just organize everything for our family and for Aunt Leonora at about the same time. Now, my father was an airline captain. And so we had uh, we had discounts on air flight and hotels and everything so he could make the plans for all of us. And what they did was they wrote and told her they were going to do this plan. And she wrote back and said, oh, no, you really needn't. I'm sure it will all work out. Like, you know, three letters later, back and forth, like two, four, six letters later, back and forth, it was, okay, if you really think that's the best way, and so my mother went ahead and they bought all the tickets. They bought all of the hotel and we got there early. My dad rented a car and, and we were asked to be able to chauffeur her around because there were special events for her. Anyway, it was, it was all planned because otherwise she probably would have stayed at home and kept translating. <laughs> but I think the most marvelous thing is what Mr. Dunbar put about describing her there at the dedication. You know, surrounded by all these children, by children. I very rarely correct my children, but uh, actually it was a hand of the cause that got Karen in a corner at a conference in Jamaica, in Kingston, Jamaica. And that's where it all started. And because I remember my, my wife coming to me, she was uh, a little bit, you know, excited. And she says, Bob, she says, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she said, Bob, uh, we, we've, we've got to do something, you know? And uh, so anyway, and uh, Christine did it very well. We, it was a bunch of letters back and forth. My wife even said she'd go down and fly with Leonora up to Panama, but uh, that didn't happen. Uh, she didn't need to do that. Thank you very much, dear Bob. And thank you, Christine, as well. I see um, time is ticking on, ladies and gentlemen. I see dear Mana, I think, has another comment or question she would wish to make. And I think that probably draws us towards the end of the questions. Mana, was there something else you wanted to add? The question I want to ask is that if this story that I heard is true or not. When Leonora was on her bed, very sick, there was a lady my, looking after her. And just before she was going to pass away, this lady saw in her room 
a whole lot of people. She saw people and people. And uh, she was so amazed to see this. And uh, it just came and then it went. Later on, she wrote, she wrote a letter and she was told, I think to the house, or, and she was told that the concourse on high had come down to take Leonora. Is this story true or not? I'm pretty positive that the story you heard is told by Anne Koto. And yes, it's true. Anne and Sergio Koto were the couple who hosted Leonora when she was so ill uh, for the last four months or so of her life in Bahia. And there was one other lady living there. It was at the time because it was like the Baha'i Institute there in Bahia. And I'm sorry I keep saying Bahia instead of Salvador because in the early days, the city was Bahia. Now the, the region is Bahia and the city is Salvador. So anyway, they ho housed her, they hosted her, they, they took their, their best room and turned it into a room for Leonora to, li to live in. She, was, she had cancer, they were treating the cancer, and, um, but she was quite ill and bedridden. And the story that Anne told is about seeing a group of, of figures and that they were, from, they were from the concourse on high to welcome her. It's a beautiful story. Another uh, description of it from the other young woman who was living there as an assistant as well. And that was Marvel Gray Gurky. And I've included her description in the manuscript for the book where she describes distinctly a luminescent sort of greenish light emanating from underneath the door jam of the, the room where Leonora was sleeping. There aren't a lot of explanations for this, except that they, she was very, very close to the next world. Those days, 1980, it was that uh, period of time from June to October of 1980, where she was staying those last months in Bahia, and the fire tablet was revealed. And it was, it was translated into English and disseminated across the planet for the Baha'is. And as soon as Leonora heard that it had arrived, she took it and she sat up in her bed and painstakingly started to write. And she literally wrote the translation of the fire tablet out in longhand into Portuguese sitting up in bed, the full thing, without any stopping, correcting, doing anything. She just wrote it out. And uh, it was like, it was the last thing I believe that she translated before she passed away in October. Thank you very much, dear Christine, for sharing that. Thank you. Unless there are any final comments or questions, ladies and gentlemen, I think we will uh, take this moment to thank Christine very much from the bottom of our hearts for this incredible, inspiring presentation. And of course, again, it's not just about learning about the life of dear Leonora and of course Christine's illustrious family and all the uh, incredible things that have been achieved, but it's the fact that we can take this for ourselves, this energy, this power, and use it in sharing our beloved faith to try and bring about some change in the world and calling on dear Leonora as well to help us assist in doing that. May I close with a quotation from Ruhia Konum? It's a quote that Ruhia Konum talked about Leonora and it was used by Mr. Dunbar in his article uh, in the Baha'i World volume that he wrote. The study of such a life as Leonora's, a life of complete consecration to Baha'u'llah and his teachings, a life of ceaseless work which for her passing at the age of 85, a life in which it never even occurred to Leonora that she was sacrificing such a life is a manual for every generation of Baha'is to study and presents an enduring challenge to all those who would follow in her footsteps. Useful. Thank you very much, Christine. Thank you.
And you've managed to condense the life of someone so incredible in such a short presentation as well, which is a, a task in itself. And I commend you for doing it so ably and in, in such an inspiring fashion. So thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, as I'm sure you're aware, from Fridays to Sundays on this deepening Zoom, we have events Mondays, Tuesdays, Thursdays and Fridays. We are going through the revelation of Baha'u'llah. You are all invited very, very warmly. And Wednesdays, we go through the advent of divine justice with Sundays being a special day where we invite a presenter to come in and speak to us. And of course, this week was the turn of dear Christine. And Ó oh, tu, bem amado, do meu coração e da minha alma, não tenho refúgio algum salvo a ti. Nada menciona o romper da aurora, a não ser em tua comemoração e louvor. Teu amor me envolve e tua graça é perfeita. Toda minha esperança está em ti. Ó oh, Deus, confere-me uma nova vida a todo instante. E confere-me a todo momento os sopros do Espírito Santo, a fim de que eu permaneça firme e constante em teu amor, alcance a maior felicidade, perceba a luz manifesta e esteja sempre em um estado de tranquilidade e submissão. Verdadeiramente, tu és o que concede dádivas, o que perdoa, o compassivo. Abdul Bahan.